There you are. Oh, oh what, a, what a pleasure. I was, I was uh, before, before I, uh, when I woke up this morning and forgive me if I'm a little slow because I, I had my second uh, COVID shot yesterday. Oh, how are you doing with it? I feel like uh, a truck hit me. Oh man, I'm sorry. What kind did you get? I got the Pfizer. Gotcha. Did you have a reaction to the first one as well? No, you know what? It was, and, and part of it might be, uh, I took some NyQuil to, to knock myself out last night, which uh, right. which didn't feel so good. I mean, it felt good at the time, but this morning, so, but uh, but I'm but I'm ready nonetheless. Good. <laughs> I'm sorry that. Uh, <laughs> Where, by the way, where did you get the shot? Oh, I got, I, I'm in Illinois. So I got it in a place called Arlington Heights, which I live just north of the city in Chicago. But, um, right. you know, I, and I was thinking, I, I, I lived in Los Angeles for quite a while, and I was always on Krista Fuller's uh, mass emails, which would always include right. you. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I started putting all the, you know, when, you know, when I'd seen your films initially, you know, when I was 12 or 13 and, and older, I, I wasn't much into the credits of certain individuals and, and directors, understandably. So I uh, it, it all makes sense now, you know, because Robert Carradine was in, you know, Sam's films and I see a lot of other connections. And then I told uh, I'm friendly with Michael Imperioli, the actor who uh, was on The Sopranos. Mm -hmm. And he grew up in Mount Vernon, um, in New York. And I was that like, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, and a lot. And David Chase is from Mount Vernon. Yeah. So, so you're among you're yeah. among good company. How how? Oh, and then I also I watched one of the uh, an interview with you where you were talking about ayahuasca, which I'll ask about later on. <laughs> but it's 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 not why I wanted to speak with you. But I wanted to ask how you doing, and otherwise. Well, you know, it's, um, I think as uh, the restrictions are beginning to um, lessen, it's a very strange kind of readjustment, mainly because um, luckily where I live, I have been able to not feel like I've been totally confined. Um, I live in Venice, California. Uh, I bike ride. I uh, put on a wetsuit and go into the ocean. That's four days. I've done that every single day. So, um and I've been doing that for, you know, before the, 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 the sort of uh, limitations and since, and it's been a, a way of not feeling that you're trapped. And that's made a difference. And then the strange thing, I think, is that every now and then, some of the contacts that we've been able to make via Zoom have actually, my experience personally, for example, um, I'm an American Jew and we celebrate uh, Shabbos, which starts tonight, Friday night. And um, what we decided to do, because we usually would have some local family come over and have a dinner and we're um, reform, which is not the, the sort of orthodox form of approaching all of this. Um, and um, what we decided to do was to sort of maybe do Zoom um, Shabbos's, which we now have. Reconnected me with relatives that I doubt I would have ever seen again in my life. People I hadn't seen for 35, 40, maybe even 50 years. And now every Friday at Pacific Standard Time at five o'clock, because they're East Coast people too, um, we all get together. And that would have never happened had this not happened. So that's very uh, sort of the, the positive and negative as to any particular kind of experience and how you use it and how you work with it. In front of the, I'm a professor at the School of Cinematic Arts at uh, U University of Southern California. And of course, we've had to change all of our class um, uh, from being in-person classes to being online classes, virtual classes. <laughs> and what's been fascinating there is things one is some of these classes are actually a little bit better because of the intimacy of look at a face sure now they're not as good as being in person because there's nothing like the energy that's exchanged between human beings in the same space that's a that and that's not a that's a biochemical metaphysical exchange not necessarily just a visual exchange 
The other thing is that the students under pressure of the limitations of the bubbles that they're supposed to quote uh, make their films. Some of them have made remarkable films, films comparable to films that were before that may even be better. And I think that there's a whole, I guess it, it's a choice that you always have when there's a lot of pressure. It, it's how you're going to respond. And for some people, when there's a lot of pressure, what happens is it, it, it debilitates them. And I understand perfectly how that, why it happens and, and how they feel. Um, but for others, what it does is it stimulates their potential creativity. And so they, well, I can't do this, I can't, but I could do this. Hmm. And then think- what happens is some of them is just, um, I, I just think it's quite remarkable. I mean, we're finishing a series of uh, uh, that is in one specific class. It's a core class at, the, at USC in graduate school. And the set of films there, both comedies and sort of very difficult pieces are remarkable. And some of them, yes, do deal with the issue of the separate, uh, uh, but others have nothing to do with it at all. And you wouldn't realize that they were made in this particular. So this, this, this capacity to adopt and, I mean, I guess it's evolutionary, and also create is there even when you have limitations that you didn't want. Mm-hmm. Like being inward, like having to be by yourself. And, and create and, and conceptualize, which isn't very easy for certain people unless forced to be. And I think in the situation like this in the last year, people have really come into, into their own. I, I've had, it has not been a bad year for me um, on a lot of levels because right. I've been forced to be in that position and also say, well, I'm not gonna come out of this pandemic with nothing to show for it. And, uh, but don't you marvel at how amazing and how uh, you talk about evolutionary uh, technology is now. When I was in film school, I mean, I there were classes I just couldn't take because I couldn't afford the the processing fees and for for sixteen millimeter. And now on a phone, on a phone with a high definition, you could make a nice little verite documentary or even a film. There's no question about it. You look at things like uh, about two or three years ago, the movie Tangerine, which was all shot on an iPhone on uh, kind of a uh, like like a little steady cam. I just got one of these devices that you can put the, your iPhone on, which is about this big, right? right. Um, and it's a, a it's an absolute gyro you know gyroscoping device. Uh, works spectacularly. I did our first sort of leaving town and went to visit uh, my um, daughter and granddaughter who live in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And oh, cool. um, I took this with uh, with me and and uh, with the granddaughter, I made two films, one stop action film with uh, all of her dolls and another one um, that was a live action film with some friends and cousins in the neighborhood because they're all well, when they were mass or mass, but they were outside for this particular thing. And, it, you know, it looked fabulous because, you know, the fact is the Filmex Pro on an iPhone with on one of these things like an Osmo and a decent computer with, a, you know, an Adobe Premiere or, or, or you know, um, Final Cut if you're, and you've got a movie. You know, the only thing that's incredible. limiting you now is the stories you're telling and it's the people that you're working with, meaning, you know, who's the person. So in one way, we have changed gigantically in terms of um, the access to um, uh, the material you need to make the films. But at the same time, as I look at film students, the opportunities for them to actually have careers are more limited 30 years ago, even though there's far more distribution uh, spaces in terms of, you know, a lot of streaming and cables and all the rest, opportunities are not as great. And just in terms of actually having, you know, professions, um, as I'm, I'm looking at the directors, because um, that's specialized in teaching, whereas, um, so that's, that's a, a sort of fascinating contradiction in one way, one way, any movie, and in another way, can you actually have that as your career? That's much more challenging to be. Was this a career that you envisioned as a, as a 21, 22 year old? 
absolutely not not at all um uh i'm looking at abby over here laughing at me this is abby hoffman here uh yeah. laughing at me <laughs> no i was a uh, i was socially and politically minded during that particular time and my interest was if anything um at one time I, the, the law and then i honestly was not i took classes in it when i was at college and did not enjoy them at, at all uh, i like the philosophy of the law but i certainly didn't like the details of it um and then i, I thought of education um in some form particularly education that would make people more aware and potentially more active uh, in terms of their own policy in terms of their own communities um and so that's what I was fascinated by in terms of how you specifically would use, and I don't even know if I would have used the word media back then, but I was thinking in terms of film, I would have used that word, and how it affects uh, people's consciousness. And I was interested in learning about that in order to be able to then potentially teach that, potentially be some kind of an advocate that used uh, film, um, but uh, to be a filmmaker was not something that I had any interest whatsoever. I mean, I liked when I was a little kid, and I still do. I love it, actually. In fact, my most recent movie that I just made is a 30-minute animated film from drawings that I did um, uh, over the last year and a half. Wow. Um, so I've been always into animation, even when I was little. I mean, when we would go to the theaters, all I cared about were the, were the animated cartoons because we would be seeing B and C feature films that either scared me or didn't interest me. And I never asked the question, how did that get made? Never. Um, my shock was um, I learned uh, in my high school, it was the first high school in New York City to teach the Russian language. And my grandparents were from uh, Russia. Uh, although they didn't speak, I rarely saw them. But the point is that um, Russia was at that time declaratively our enemy. The wall was up, etc. Uh, um, my attitude was that um, if you learn the language of, I was very naive. If you learn learn the language of the enemy, the enemy is no longer the enemy. So um, they were teaching it, and I decided to do it. And it's, I guess it's in my blood a little bit, but so it was fair for me to learn. Um, and one of my teachers took us to see movies that were in Russian. They were showing in New York City at the, the two theaters that showed the um, alternative movies like The Thalia and The New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And we saw a double bill, and on that double bill was a movie that um, literally stopped me in my tracks. Uh, I was in ninth grade. And um, I remember this thing and my eyes just got wider and wider because I'd never seen anything like it ever before. And I knew the music, I'm a musician, um, and I would study classical music when I was young, so I recognized it, but I didn't know it was associated with a movie. And I was just, I came out of the theater and literally said for the first time in my life, who made that? I didn't know people made just there. Who? And that movie was made by the genius Sergei Eisenstein, and the wow. movie was called uh, um, Alexander Nevsky. And the music was by Prokofiev. And it is, even today, an astounding piece of work. It mixes sort of operatic style with incredible visuals and dynamic sequences. There's a battle sequence called The Battle on the Ice that still is one of the great battle sequences. People copy that sequence continuously. Um, I mean, even in you know, you know, modern movies, you will see quotes from it. I mean, the theme from Jaws is this quote from the Prokofiev the coffee of music in, in this particular uh, uh, movie. Um, so that shifted me and I decided and I see how film it can be and is used because it was also very much a, a, a political advocacy film about and this World War II was just about to start, start and this was about the invading um, Niemitz, which is the word for foreigner Germans who come with the religious justification to destroy the Slavs and destroy the Russians and so you know this was a an advocacy film about the strength of the Russian people. Um, and it was very effective during that time. It's still quite effective even then now, if you take 
So therefore, I, I got the idea that movies have this potential. And, and then um, I began to sort of really become interested in and what was happening at that particular time was there European filmmakers were emerging to, in the consciousness of Americans um, that were, you know, master filmmakers from Bergman to Fellini to all the people that were part of the Nouvelle Vague, you know, to Renoir and uh, that time, but Godard in particular and, and Truffaut and um, uh, Alan René, these people really made a difference in terms of my consciousness of the film was an art form uh, and also a political art form. And so I decided to learn how to make movies in order to be able to then use them for that kind of purposes. And uh, that time you'll get this. There were five school graduate schools that taught film courses. That was it. Five in the United wow. States. They're well now over 750 to 800. That How many in New York at that time? Four? It was just, it was just actually in New York. Yeah. There was literally NYU. Right. There was BU. There was the Annenberg School in the uh, University of Pennsylvania. And there were coast schools, uh, USC and UCLA. And I had absolutely no interest in Hollywood whatsoever. So there was no, even though I got into all these guys, uh, schools, I certainly was never going to go to the West Coast. Who cares? Hollywood? What did Hollywood make? Um, little did I know. I mean, you know, I, I learned inevitably that, of course, Hollywood has made some of the greatest movies that ever have been made. Um, and that lots of these filmmakers who I admired enormously admire Hollywood filmmakers. But I, you know, I, I didn't know that until I started were there, to were, study were there, film and to make it. And, yeah. No, were there, were there directors that I was I just going to say, when I, when I, go ahead. I was just going to say that what hap happened to me was when I started to make film, uh, actually to do it and then it was a very very hands-on very kind of different from now well i guess not in the sense that the camera's a camera you really had to know how to work in a, a, a bolex or a, a, an eclair um and really understand how these things actually function in our reflect and then in the editing room it was a very physical process i mean you were touching film you were using a device that, like a scissor device, you were gluing it together. You sure. were putting it in a moviola. And yes, the flatbeds came out and you were doing that, but it was very, and I enjoyed that physical nature to it. To it. And I fell in love with the whole process. Um, and partially because, you know, I write, I perform, I'm a musician, I'm a graphic artist. And what I realized was that all these things that I love to do sort of, scholarship which is the way i was raised uh, um they're all in this one form of creation. so you know i'm working with composers i'm working with graphic artists i'm working with actors i'm working with you know writers and stories so and it's all one uh, and so it's it, you know I, I suddenly realized this is something that i want to do but again hollywood I was headed uh, um, how, much case, of, how much of this was nurtured yeah. how much of this was nurtured by your parents and i'd love for you to tell me about your childhood because I, I know that your dad was a rabbi and a reform rabbi so it, it'd be very interesting mm -hmm. to uh to hear about them and i'm also fascinated by the fact that not a lot of not a lot of jews were reformed back then i know that it, it became very popular that's the way i was raised but um it, it just you know, especially in New York City, where you still had a lot of Frum Jews and a lot of uh, Yiddish kites. I, I now at 50 years old, really admire those reformed Jews, the ones who really kind of uh, exported their beliefs. And it's it, it's actually gotten stronger. It's still a very, it's still a very profound and active movement. Yeah, I think what, you know, I, I've been actually thinking about this just recently, because when I made the movie The Chosen back in 1981, um, the experience of making that particular movie from the brilliant book by Chaim Potok was that I got exposed to a side of uh, Judaism and to a culture of Judaism that I didn't know anything about, nothing about it. Um, my father's pulpit was um, a social responsibility pulpit. Um, he marched with uh, Martin Luther King Sr. and Jr. Uh, during the Civil Rights Movement. He was uh, uh, an advocate for peace, um, and uh, he was a quite a brilliant writer, and he also was the first clergyman in New York State to be certified as a psychotherapist. He got a PhD in 1950 um, wow. in, in that in Columbia. So he was, this was, this was how he was using his um, uh, rabbinate as a 
social activist and motivator for his congregation and also as a therapist for them and then independently as well. So that's the world that I grew up in Judaism. And so, um, you know, I, my Hebrew was minimal when I was, uh, um, and it still is pretty. How do you think your dad, uh, did you, did you feel like you knew him as a young man? I mean, was it, was he, did you admire him? I mean, that's, did that inform your work? I admired him enormously. Um, I thought he was a great speaker with a terrific sense of humor, and he was willing to treat me on, on, as a kind of intellectual equal even when I was young. But I don't know if I really got to know him. Know him in the sense that I often now, because of my own spiritual path, have lots of questions I would have liked to have asked. Um, I would have liked to have asked him why he decided to become a reform rabbi. He was 16 years old and he went to the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati and also went to the University of Cincinnati at the same time, wow. two schools, same time. And how he, how, how he adapted to that, why make some choices. And I would have loved to talk to him much more deeply about his sort of understanding of, of sort of the, the concept of the soul. What, it, what, what did it really mean to him? Did it mean something to him? Um, and we never got to have those conversations. Uh, the one moment that is a, was an important moment for me is the very first film sort of I did at um, um, NYU grad school, because that's the one I chose to go to, because as I said, I wasn't interested in Hollywood, um, was an animated movie, a seven minute animated movie that ended up winning the best student animation film of the year, also played at a theater. Um, and I remember when he saw it, it was a year before he died, a little less than that. He said, you just did something really well that I have absolutely no idea how to do. And that probably was the first time there was this exchange here because as a writer, you know, um, or as an essayist, he was you know, far better than I would ever be. Um, so in that sense, I would always be the, the son of. Uh, but here, having made this particular piece, it was like, oh, wow, this is a world that you're good at that I don't know anything about. Um, so no, that's that that when I when I went back to watch your films, knowing that I was going to talk to you, at least a few of them, the ones that, that had made such an impact on me as a young man. Uh, and, it, I, and I realized they still did, because seeing them as an adult and seeing what you got out of these actors, uh, you got such a human quality out of all of them, such as something so almost visceral, like I could just really feel even Robbie Benson in The Chosen, and then going back to watch um, Conspiracy, which I had watched the, uh, the Aaron Sorkin version, and I remember getting through it, at, and at the time not realizing that you had uh, directed the, the 1987 version that I'd seen on HBO when I was in high school. And I, I felt it was so lacking. I had to watch yours again. I found it on YouTube, and then it had been released on um, on Prime the next month. And I go and when I when I saw that you had directed it, and and I and I Googled your name, and you'd written a piece in the foreword, uh, which really reinforced a lot of the things that I was thinking about. What was it that that inspired you to 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 write that article, and how did that that come about? Well, first of all, I, I have to step back and say Please. that I have enormous admiration for Aaron Sorkin. Um, I directed a number of West Wings myself. Um, I think the guy is a truly brilliant writer, and I think his political stance in terms of progressive ideas and fairness is, is strong, and he is, I think, made an enormous difference by creating that particular series. Um, so. For me, you know, there is a, no question that I think he's uh, an exceptional uh, artist and and um, and responsible in the way he uses his art, as I think we all should be. Um, but when I saw his movie, because of the inaccuracies and misrepresentations, um, for the sake of um, what we'll call good narrative storytelling. Uh, I was extremely bothered um, because it just there, there there are things that are in the movie that are just not true, 
And to give the sense that this is going to be the truth is really, I think, a dangerous uh, process. And I, I want to reflect on it in a second that when I made my movie, um, and, and I, I had made a movie called Catherine um, that was made for um, ABC um, a number of years before that. And this movie was based on what was called the Weather Underground. This is a group of young people who started out um, really wanting to see uh, civil rights, fairness, um, uh, voter rights and registration, the end the war that was then uh, going on in uh, Vietnam, um, and found themselves so um, blocked by the system that they were able, unable to accomplish anything. And in fact, oftentimes were punished for their belief systems and their actions. And some of them went to get to be more and more radicalized to the point of which they actually thought that certain kinds of violent action would be appropriate to actually make change happen. Um, and that was this, this was based on, loosely based on uh, one of the young women who actually died in an explosion, um, uh, uh, and Diana Outen. And um, I was asked uh, by producer Jerry Eisenberg, who I'd worked with uh, on another piece that uh, got nominated for the uh, best um, children's movie uh, television thing. And um, we became friends and he said, would you do this? And I wrote a screenplay, a more and more like a biological, a biographical, biological too. Um, and then in the end, the family said that they, they just couldn't do it. It was too hard for them. So Jerry said, why don't you write a, a, a fictionalized narrative based on the same incidents, which is what I did. Uh, cast uh, Sissy Spacek and Art Carney, the Academy Award winner to play her father. And it was one of the best moves I've ever made. And it covers sort of the seven years of the development of the radicalization of a young American woman from being uh, from the upper middle classes to really be out, out on the streets. Um, the movie got a lot of attention. Um, and then CBS came and said, would you do a movie about the conspiracy trial? Which I knew about, of course, because you know I was around in 1968 uh, during the riots in Chicago and 1969 during that trial. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and I knew Abby in New York vaguely because uh, I, you know, he, he lived there and he would be a spokesman there, and I'd sometimes go to places where he was, you know, speaking because he was incredibly smart and and, and dynamic, and. Um, so I decided to do this and I had a way I was going to have a live rock band be on stage all the time in the movie and uh, it was really quite sort of quite a, quite a piece that I'd written and I met all of them I met you know people that are behind me on this screen Bobby Seale and uh, and Tom Hayden and uh, Jerry Rubin and Rennie Davis and uh, so they're there and they're um and um uh, it was a fabulous experience to understand more deeply who these people were, why they made the choices that they made. Um, and CBS decided this was far too radical a movie for them to make. They weren't going to make it. But I had the experience of writing it and meeting these people, and, and that was in itself you know, incredibly exciting. So fine. A number of years later, I get a call from one of my agents saying, you know that thing you wrote uh, about the Chicago Conspiracy Trust? I said, yeah. Um, it was based on what? I said, well, it was based on all the transcripts. Um, you know, I went through literally and, and the interviews I did with all the real people. And I said, oh, well, uh, HBO, this new company, HBO, would like to make it. And I said, what? This is years later. I don't understand. Well, apparently there had been an article in the TV Guide, which I had never seen, about the best scripts that never got made. And the first script that was talked about in this article, how this happened, I have no idea, was the one that I'd written. So I sat down with the HBO people, there are about 20 of them in this room, <laughs> and at that time I said, well, this is the way I'd like to make it, I, I, want, I want to shoot it on video. They all looked at me with these strange eyes, because in those days nobody shot anything on video except for some live shows. I want to do it because I want to take all the documentary footage that actually exists, that was shot during that time, and I want to be able to create a stage in which we'll do th something, green screens, they, kind of vaguely knew what that was that will slide in and out so that as somebody's testifying you'll actually see what they're talking about the real footage and I also want to integrate the interviews that I did with all of those people the video introduced of the real people right. so that when an actor Carl Lumley who's playing Bobby Seale is being bound and gagged the real Bobby Seale will appear right over his uh, head and uh, talk about the experience integrating the real people within. They're all sort of like, 
oh, okay, I guess, because it's that no one had sort of made a movie quite like this. And but they let me do it. Um, very limited amount of budget, but we did it. Um, it was so funny the kind of the digital work that we had to do in order to make this work, uh, this integrating of these three different levels uh, was incredibly complicated, which now we could do in a half a second on the machine at home, but not back then. But here's the point. Everything in that movie happened. And one of the things that happened on the last day of the movie, I asked all the real defendants to come to the set here in L.A., um, and every one of them was there except David Dellinger, who was in prison because of a peace activist thing he had done. Um, and they all showed up um, and they were there. And we, the last scene in our movie, you see them um, with the actors that are playing them. It's quite wonderful. Um, and one of the things that happened, as I remember Tom and Jerry Rubin and uh, Tom Hayden, Jerry Rubin and, and Abby over here, beginning, to, I saw them arguing about something that we were staging. And uh, what's going on? Well, it is true that Jerry Rubin did Heil Hitler, Judge Hoffman, played by David Avatashu. Great performance by David, yeah. um, equal to Frank Langella, who did a fabulous job as well. But um, um, they were arguing, did he stand on a chair or did he stand on a table? Now, they were all there. The reporter said that he stood on a table, so that's where I got my, quote, fact. But everything else in this piece was, in fact, said by these people at the time. They never said anything that they didn't actually say that was recorded. One of the things that, that Tom and Jerry, and particularly Tom and Abby, were saying who were friendly, not enemies, um, was that this is now going to be the history of the event. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, before this, it was articles and books that were written about it. Now here's this movie, and this will be the reference. People will refer to it. And now people will refer to the most recent movie, this year's movie. Right. And the problem is threefold. There are three major events in this movie that are not true. And they are now, if you will, going to be the truth because people are going to look at this movie if they want to know about the Chicago conspiracy trial. The first one, and the one that I think is the most bothersome to me, is the way that Dave Dellinger is treated. Dave Dellinger was a peace activist. He believed that there can be no peace without justice. He was a conscientious subjector during World War II, if you can imagine. Yeah. Um, and um, he never hit anybody during the trial. In fact, the one thing he did physically during the trial, when they were attacking Bobby Seale, the African-American that was bound and gagged, he put his body in the way of the officers so that they couldn't quite get to Bobby as easily. They had to throw him aside, but he didn't resist. In the movie, he punches somebody. It's a great dramatic moment works like gangbusters. It's not true. And I remember seeing a webinar with two of his daughters, grown women now, and they were literally crying that their father now is rep misrepresented in this particular movie. The second thing that's, that's bothersome for me about the movie has to do with the, the treating treatment of Bobby Seale. Bobby Seale did not, Fred Hampton never came to the trial. That's not true, never was there. What can I tell you? Um, and uh, he is in the movie, the new movie. And uh, Bobby um, spoke for himself since he was a co-creator of the Black Panthers. He didn't need somebody to advise him. Um, he's a very smart, and very articulate man. Um, so was and, Huey Newton. Exactly. And yeah. he stood up, by the way, for himself um, repeatedly in the trial, um, confronting the judge. And when he was bound and gag, he was bound and gag over a number of days, which are all sort of you know, reported in and seen in my movie. They got worse and worse to the point of which, also interesting enough, not true in the new movie, but very true in the, in the, in the reality is, as the other prosecutor, Ferran, um, who was an equal participant in interviewing people um, uh, as a prosecutor, not somebody just sitting there um, and, and giving some snide looks. And uh, that's not what happened. 
Um, he was as much an advocate in the, and he gave opening and closing statements, et cetera. Not just Schultz that uh, is in the, the, the new movie. And he was even saying, we've got to you know, let this guy go. You can't do this. Okay. The third thing that, that was disturbing is the, in fact, the very end, which is a great end to a movie. Oh, it's fabulous. Good narrative. Didn't happen. The moment that the names of the uh, soldiers were read was not the last day of the trial. It was on day 23, 28, can't remember, of a 106-day trial. And the person who read all those names was not Tom Hayden. It was, it was Dellinger. It was David Dellinger. Yeah. And not only did Dellinger read all those names, but he read names of Vietnamese people who had been killed that week as well. Wow. Because he understood that this was a a war in which innocents were being killed on all sides. And that's who David was. And it's a great scene in my movie. Uh, um, there's this great fight over an American flag that actually happened because they put an American flag and a Vietnam flag out on the table and the guards came and grabbed the flags and there's this great struggle of grabbing these flags. And it's... So I'll, I'll tell I had you problems. That. I had problems with the fact that, and you know, the, the issue of, is is that other movie a really good narrative movie you bet it is yeah. are there good performances sure they're good performances is it an accurate reflection of what these people did and their courage and the dangers to them and how this all evolved no it's not so i needed to you know be one of the voices that said and i could be a voice said not just because i've read stuff go look at my movie yes I almost had to watch your film to cleanse my palate after watching that because I, I I remember feeling such a connection to yours and and in such a way that it made me ask those questions about the generational clash and the inability of 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 the the what do you want to call it the uh, the existing state at the time really wasn't equipped to understand or, or deal with this new train of thought there's a line in there where i don't know if it's rennie davis who said it or tom hayden who tells the prosecutor look when this is over i'd like to maybe speak about this man to man and harris yulin i forgot who he played but the harris played played the foran actually for yeah. and, the, and the, the other the prosecutor yeah and there was such an in he was stunned because it was such a it was just a very, I thought it was a very sincere, you know, it also works well in the political theater that they were creating, but it, he didn't know how to deal with this. And he looks at the judge who, who Judge Hoffman uh, knew nothing. I mean, it, it, it's sad. And when he was, when he was protesting the fact that he was called a racist, I felt that he in deep in his heart. And if he went as deep as his soul, uh, uh, knew that he wasn't, and he too was a German Jew, you know, and which is, you'll have to tell me that story that I read about uh, the actor wanting you to say the word Yeka, yeah. but, but it, I remember thinking as a 17 year old, because I, I thought that I know where my family stood, you know, very, it, it's sort of like the, the Phil Oak song, love me, love me, I'm a liberal, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, I love Puerto Ricans and Negroes as long as they don't move next door. That was, that was sort of the ethos embraced by people that did uh, teach their children the right way, but yeah. we had to suss out our own you know, ethnic experience. And oddly enough, I graduated from the same high school that Bill Ayers went to um, and have gotten, gotten to know them you know, a little over the years because they're in Chicago. But my school was this great cultural, I thought it was like a cultural bastion. You know, the kids from the South Side, the black kids were, were the stars at the school. and and uh you know international kids and it was only 300 students and bill ayers had gotten that same it was a little waspier when he went but the reason i bring that up is that i i knew that there was something uh probably uh disheartening for those involved at the time when I, when in your film when michael lembeck who's playing uh, abby hoffman is talking to, to judge julius hoffman and calling him julie it really felt like this was a son going after his father and the father just kind of like your dad saying rather than saying that was amazing Jeremy that it's like you did something that I couldn't do that was his way of complimenting you 
Right. And but and there's a breakdown in communication there, no matter what, if you know, obviously you still loved and admired your dad. But I have similar ex exchanges with my father, who's a little older than you. But it, it's I, I, I really felt that with your film with with the new one. I didn't feel it as much. And there was there was no Jewishness in the new one where you had, you know, Abby Hoffman and this really interesting, you know, confluence of, of Jews. Yeah. It, it's just to me, Perfect. you got, you nailed it. They didn't. But I'm not here to to to. to you know, uh, it's, it's interesting about about this. It, it really is the um, I think that the story Iron tells a, a, about getting this job is probably really a significant story. Because when Steven and I, you know, I know Steven Spielberg and I've worked with him. Uh, um, you know, I worked on one of his series about uh, UFOs because that's some, I've made a movie about that as well, um, called Roswell. Um, and I, I don't know if Steven had seen this movie. I found out uh, when I was interviewing Aaron just a couple of weeks ago for the Directors Guild Meet the Nominees uh, series that we do, that he um, uh, had seen my movie. Uh, he doesn't acknowledge it, but he said he had. And I even asked him, I said, Aaron, how about you and I have a, a conversation, you know, for, at, let's say, at USC, uh, comparing the different approaches? And he said, sure, let's do it, let's do it. But um, so far, we've not been able to arrange that, and I don't know if it's going to happen. But it would be interesting to have this conversation, see the choices that he made. But the thing is, he didn't know a thing about the trial. When he, when Stephen said, would you do this? He said yes, and then he, as he says, he called his dad and said, "Dad, what happened?" Because you know it's not part of his knowledge. So it was all a historical kind of. Oh, this is I'm going to look at history and I'm going to rewrite history to good narratives to tell the story I want to tell. And clearly, I mean, the movie does have progressive ideas. There's no question about it. But it doesn't have what I would call the courage um, and the commitment um that was um so intense for all of these people and the realization that all of them all these people behind me at this moment that we lived and lived in a system that is an oppressive system mm -hmm. that we all like and admire and all can praise all of the phenomenal things that america represents but also have to admit what america is responsible for mm -hmm. it's built on slavery it just is. If it weren't slavery, we wouldn't be all sitting here as we are now. It is built on the destruction of the native peoples that were here, the killing of 90% of the indigenous people who were the original Americans. Let's just admit it. It's built on a war machine. Is that a hard thing for most people? Why do you think it's so hard for people to admit that? Because it's so painful. Who wants to go and carry that kind of pain and that kind of, if you will, guilt? I don't. I don't want to feel that. And a lot of times for me, the way I get around it is, oh, but I'm an American Jew. I'm an immigrant too, second generation immigrant. But, you know, my people suffered for 2000 years. So, you know, this is the sort of, then I can now start to identify with the Lakota. Well, I'm sorry, it just doesn't quite work that way. They don't even need to go back 2000 years. They could have done 1840 to 1945 or 1946, it's enough. Yeah. And so the, so the ability to admit who we are. And remember, one of the amazing things about the defense, which is not represented in this new movie at all, is who they called to testify. You got, you know, Judy Collins singing a song and having her mouth stopped by one of the officers because the judge wouldn't have her sing in court. You got Allen Ginsberg, who's represented as kind of foolish in the movie reading part of Howell in court. Now, those of us who read Howell know this is one of the great anti-capitalist, anti-sort of uh, uh, totalitarian poems ever written, and it's about America. And these are the people who are saying, because this wasn't just a political trial, which is what Aaron was emphasizing, and of course it was, and everybody knew right from the start it was. It wasn't it wasn't being discovered, but that's the way he wanted to tell the story. Of course, it was a political trial. Everybody knew that. But what was really on trial was a look at American culture, which could be on trial right now. You know, 
one of the amazing things to to look at is to and I had this experience of going to Germany. Um, I had a movie that was playing at the Berlin Film Festival, a movie that I did for Disney called The Journey of Natty Gann. And oh, it was yeah. my first time in, in, in Berlin. And I was really and this is before the war went down. And I was 1985 and I was really concerned and angry and, and feeling like, you know, the first thing I'm going to do is spit on the ground. And I think I did. And the spit went right into my face because there was wind going up. It was a perfect sort of metaphor. Yeah, and as yeah. I started to meet people in the next generations and talk, I realized they're all talking about it. Yep. They're all talking about what did our fathers and grandparents and grandmothers, what did they do? Why did they associate with Hitler? Why did they become Nazis? Would, could we redo that ourselves? And that was a conversation that was being had everywhere I went. So the point is, they are accepting the responsibility that they have generationally to something that is one of the awful things in the last hundred years. Have we done that? And the cultural revolution that all of these people behind me represented were saying, we have to do that. Mm -hmm. We have to accept our responsibilities. We have to really talk them through. We have to understand, like Rennie Davis, you know, at the end of the trial, every one of these people uh, testified, not just Abby, although Abby's was in many ways the most amusing. And because Abby was a history buff, he knew all about everything yes. he knew about Lincoln. And, you know, and Lincoln would have been put on trial in just along with them because of what Lincoln said about, you know, overthrowing a government that it was non responsible to the needs of the people. But, you know, Rennie Davis in his, he's a Boy Scout. Rennie just recently died. I hope his soul soars. Um, he, he held up this little thing and described what it does. It, it was this bomb that sends out nails yeah. and destroys everything in its path, human, animal, whatever it is. And it does not necessarily destroy the structure. It's meant just to kill lives. Yep. And these are the things that we were creating and dropping on, on these towns in Vietnam. And it, it's so powerful to just sort of just to hear this, to say, this is what we are doing. Recognize it, deal with it, discuss it, take responsibility for it. And I feel like, you know, there's Rennie, where is Rennie up there? There he is. I feel like it was wonderful to, to have that in the movie that we made because what the defense wanted us to do was to be conscious of who we are and not suffer from the guilt but move past it to a sense of righteousness, fairness, responsibility, mm -hmm. which, you know, in some ways right now is beginning to happen in the areas of, uh, well, I was going to say, obviously, Black Lives Matter and Latinx issues. Social I discourse. Was also, I was also going to just say the areas of gun violence. Yeah. You know, the last feature film I made three years ago is a movie called Shot. Um, and the movie is about the consequences of what one bullet does to a whole bunch of people's lives. And, and it's a really good movie. Unfortunately, in its distribution, it just didn't get out there. Um, but it can be watched on Amazon. And it's a very, very strong, strong film about gun violence. And the issue, I mean, the idea that we as a nation do not really stop and look at the fact that every single day, 100 people are going to get shot, that over 35,000 killed that 60% of those are suicides by, by handguns that are too easily able to be gotten. Yeah. Is there a reason for, for, for having these machine guns in people's hands all across this country? Compared to anywhere else in the world, we are 10 times to sometimes 50 times more violent in gun violence than any other society, including societies that are at war at this moment. And this is a daily activity of our culture. Are we going to stop and look at ourselves and say, is this who we are? And if this is who we are, what are we going to do about it? And that's what all these people represented. And that's what I know in the movie that we all made is in it, that energy, that sense of responsibility, that promise that, you know, we can do something to really shift our culture. I feel like in the new movie, that's not where that movie is. Do you think, though, generationally, um, I've always looked, I've looked to your generation for lots of answers and, and have looked at, uh, at it with admiration because of how articulate those gentlemen behind you were, that they were all 
if you want to take the, the term best and brightest, you know, which was des you know, describing Kennedy's administration, that this was the best and brightest of, of, of our outspoken students and, and people like uh, Dellinger, who was older than these, these guys, yet still found, uh, I guess you want to call it a cultural simpatico or something like that. But it's, uh, there, was, there, there was bravery. I, I, you know, again, it's still, you're, you're dealing with film. It's, it's not always three-dimensional. You get as close as you possibly can to it. But do you feel as though that younger directors, ones that come through your, your classroom, have a responsibility to, to not be revisionist in, in the way certain films dealing with history are? Do you, do you think that, where's the responsibility lie? I, I don't like seeing when things are historically inaccurate in films. Yeah, yeah, you know, first of all, there is the, I mean, just the general concept of any kind of literature. There is the, the license of creativity of a good uh, storyteller or artist, you know, and that means where do you put your eye if you're the painter? Um, you know, are you showing uh, Maximilian getting shot uh, during the uh, at the end of the Napoleonic rules of, of Mexico? Right. Or are you showing the people who are shooting him? Right, um, right. You know, so the, the 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 issue of point of view is the artist's challenge and 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 right. Um, the issue of of uh, accuracy. Um, this is we're in a t very very strange time in which what is truth is being continually challenged obviously the phrase you know fake has become you know worldwide in terms of just information uh, and clearly misinformation is easy and what is even easier and this is the most disturbing part of all of this is that not only can my voice be recreated and therefore other words be uh, you know said that I didn't say sentences, but so can my face. Um, and um, the sophistication in terms of where this is in terms of cinema at this moment is so um, developed that um, there could be another me right next to me. Um, and that other me could look and sound exactly like me and um, saying things that I didn't say. Right. And we're going to be in a place now where the two dimensional experience, which is what you and I are having right now, yeah. is going to be less and less trusted because it's going to be able to be, you know, re recreated and reformed. And you just don't know if it's true or not unless the person is actually there, um, which is going to be a fascinating time and a challenging time because what's the truth? The other side of that, um, though, that you bring about is um, I teach a class called Media for Social Change, and I teach a, uh, I'll run something called the Change Making Media Lab at USC, and all of these are about using film to be able to either awaken people to realities they don't know about, or potentially even motivate people to change. Um, and we study the, the process of change in terms of sociology and psychology, um, and we look at what media um, is successful at it and why, and what elements within media are successful. Um, and uh, my students are looking at this as well, and my students are, are then taking on these social issues. And it's interesting, a lot of them are gender issues. Um, a lot of them immigration issues. I'm just saying the subjects most recently lo being looked at um, even this uh, last semester. Um, interesting enough, some are on the issue of gun violence. Um, the one that is the uh, uh, most interesting because there are not that many pieces that the students are making it about, even though they're aware of it, is the issue of global warming. And um, obviously we live in a time, if you want a crisis, we got a worldwide crisis by the way, uh, in which infectious diseases are a product of global warming. Sure. That we're dealing with something that is so pressing on the survival of this, literally of our species, certainly of 50% of the other species that are existing in the planet at this moment, they're all in jeopardy. Um, and the questions have been become, you know, what will happen to all of us if we don't really gather together and recognize we have to stop the fossil fuel emissions? There's just no question about this. It's not something like, it's not arguable. Well, will we do it? You know, or are we in one way 
you know, is there, you know, there's an interesting, Freud talked about Eros and Thanatos as two concepts that he believed in as motivating concepts of behavior. One is a positive, creative, interconnected, interrelational uh, uh, idea, which is the Eros part of it. And Thanatos is the Greek word for death um, and the drive for self-destruction. Um, and the question is, you know, are we a species that is driving for its own self-destruction besides destroying other species? I don't have the answer to that, but I know that that's what we're facing right now. And I also know that it's really difficult for filmmakers to actually take it on. Yeah. It's just, uh, you know, it's like for younger filmmakers, some of them have said, well, I'm not feeling it yet. Although, interestingly enough, I was talking to uh, um, this week, I've been uh, mentoring for the Climate Reality Project. This is former Vice President Al Gore's organization that trains now almost 30,000 people to be able to share information. Um, and I asked the, the, the people that I'm mentoring, um, have you had any direct experience of, of global warming? And what's fascinating is that, as I'm not surprised, most of them say no, because most of them actually are, you know, from well-to-do uh, areas, uh, even though this is a free uh, training. Um, right. But there were people like, uh, there was a young woman from the Philippines, um, and she said, oh yeah, when I was 10 year old, uh, 10 years old, my, my, my house flooded. But it was kind of fun at 10 years old. I mean, my parents were freaked, but you know, so wow, look at all the water everywhere. But interesting enough, a bunch of people from uh, who are on this particular group uh, from the San Francisco area, their answer was yes. The fires spread into the air and they breathed the soot and the pollution. Um, so they actually felt it. I mean, this last so, year was insane. I've never seen anything like it. So in this sense, People now, you know, it, it's interesting if it doesn't touch, you know, they're not in my backyard. If it doesn't touch me, it's not my problem. Um, people are beginning to have it touch them and it is their problem. So now the question is, can you make media that's going to stimulate others to action? Um, and that's something that, you know, this conversation started with uh, looking at the Sergei Eisenstein's movies. And he definitely was a political filmmaker wanting to stimulate people to fairness. Um, and at the same time, you know, here we are um, you know, almost 100 years uh, later uh, from his early movies in the 20s um, and, and still looking at how does cinema in all of its forms and all of its distributions from the iPhone to the, you know, to the IMAX, how does it, you know, change your perception of the world and motivate you to um, into action? Are you inspired by your students? Do you do you see some real uh, shining lights in 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 the chairs or in the uh, the virtual chairs? Are they intellectually curious like you were? I you know I would say that uh, there are always an individual or two or three each class where I would say yes that um, and that I've learned from them um, and I've admired their their courage in the way they've decided to tell a particular story um but it's fewer than um than one might expect even at what's called the greatest film school in the world mm -hmm. um, and i think partially that's the time um i think the spread of egoism and individualism rather than you know ecosystems rather than ecosystem concentration as you know, still been part of the breeding of the last number of generations. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a certain kind of discouragement. Um, you know, I think the Bernie movement really was an exciting moment in terms of this real rise in youth ac activity. Um, and I think we're seeing some of that again um, with the uh, in the uh, anti gun violence movement and again in the uh, uh, global warming movement and obviously represented by Greta Thunberg who you know becomes a symbol for everybody and particularly for the next generations or the or the newer generations that that they need to step up and potentially take over and be the voice because I mean look I mean it's, it, it just if you look at Congress today and you realize that well over 75% or more of Americans believe that gun violence is a horrendous thing in our country and that things like background checks and getting rid of these these you know machine guns 
um, availability and doing the research to help people be able to balance their lives and not by uh, gun violence. Um, the, the overwhelming majority of Americans believe that. And the Congress doesn't. So who are they representing? Who are they uh, representing? And the same issue of global warming. I mean, it's way, way over 65% or 70% people not only believe it, but think things needs to be done. And the idea of shifting from fossil fuels to more renewables, you know, just makes sense and everybody gets it. Mm -hmm. The Congress doesn't. Well, then we got a real disconnect between who would quote are our leaders and what we the people want. I think the state level gets it because there is all kinds of legislation and even funds provided for solar energy and renewable. I know that it's it's mandatory in California because you know it's there a couple of nuclear reactors are shut down. There's a lot that needs to be done and solar is is certainly an answer. But I want to shift away from from that sure. stuff. And I could talk to you about this until the cows come home because First of all, I, I, love how I want those cows to come home because there's an issue of cows and methane. You yeah. know, <laughs> by the way, one, I'll just say this and we'll move on. I'll well, talk to the cows until you come home. Yeah, well, the interesting thing about it, yeah, I'm home. I'm lucky. The, <laughs> is that that um, one of the major things in terms of not only sort of stopping global warming, but reducing it, which is possible. There's an organization called Project Drawdown that is interested in reducing the amount of CO2s in the air, not just stopping it going, but reducing and one of the major reductions is going to be changing our food habits, what we eat. What? You mean I can't have a cheeseburger every single day? <laughs> no. Well, how about I'm only having a, maybe one or two less every week? I'll tell That's you, I, make any difference. I stopped but, eating a lot of food in the last month, and it's just, I'm seeing weight come off of me because well, I also have a nine-year-old daughter, and I have a very bad habit of finishing her food. <laughs> but 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 still, I. Uh, no, but what I was going to say about you is that I'm glad to see that it, it, these these are still issues that motivate you, and uh, you're able to sort of merge it with with your your storytelling and and your craft and inspire other students. And there's a certain vitality in that. Otherwise, we'd be talking about the past. And it seems to me that you're a very present person. I think that, um, and I'm lucky. I'm very lucky that I I um, I look at some of my compatriot colleagues filmmakers um obviously this is this is a as many businesses are this is an ageist business in the sense that you know if you are a unless you're a big money maker if you're a certain age they've never heard of you they've never seen your films and they're not going to give you opportunities to make them now again as we talked earlier you can make your films yourself um but be, by being able to be someone who is in the process of teaching and teaching is really uh, is an exchange it's not just what I know it's what you know and it's a meeting ground between those. Um, and therefore I learn and in this sense, even though I might not say that I have exceptional you know, artists that I'm looking at at this moment and saying whoa these people are knocking me out um, in terms of who they are and what they're doing. What I am getting, and I'm getting from, I would say, half of or more, is different perceptions, different ways of looking, different ways of seeing, different experiences, uh, and that is a, a space that um, I would say keeps me a bit more contemporary, because I'm, you know, hearing what their issues are, um, and, and responding to them, and not saying, oh well, the other times were better times, because they just were different times. And if there are values, like I think there are values to the courage of all these people who are willing to risk their lives to make the world a better place, which in itself is, I mean, it's amazing. I it's mean, a nice it's ideal. I think that the current generation, are, and I'm a lot less cynical now that I have my own child. Uh, before I was, I was, you know, like, these millennial kids don't get it and blah, blah, blah. And that's very boring. And who wants to listen to a cynic or a blowhard? But um, I do think social media has got all the good elements. All, it's all the good things you could say about it and all the bad things you could say about it. I guess you could say the same thing about the state of California and Los Angeles. I love certain things about it, but I didn't like it. Uh, but what I was going to, what I want to tell, I, want, 
I'm proud to say that I will probably be the only one asking you this quest, this following question at this moment in time. And that is, what was Val Avery like? Oh, that's so sweet. Um, for those who are, for anyone who's looking at us and listening and they're saying Val Avery, um, uh, Val Avery is an actor um, who uh, worked a lot with one of my heroes and also a bit of, a, um, I would say, a mentor of mine, although I was so impressed with him that I was too <laughs> frightened and ignorant to ask him lots of questions that I would have liked to have asked my father, um, and that was John Cassavetes. Um, uh, who made masterpieces like Woman on the Influence and Husbands. Um, and John um, had a crew of actors that he liked to work with. Most of them were out of New York and, and New York theater. And, and Val Avery was one of them. Val Avery is an American actor, great character actor, um, and um, great sense of humor, very loving and open man, very proud of his Armenian heritage. Um, and. Uh, uh, and what I did when I started to make my pieces is I oftentimes would go ask people who had worked in John's movies, would they work in mine? And, and Val did on some of my, uh, I think my second show that I did professionally was a Columbo. Um, and I cast uh, Val to play a little part in that. And, um, and Val played parts in, in Heroes, my very first feature film. And, and some other movies that I made. Um, and I always enjoyed going to New York to uh, come to his house to have a good Armenian uh, meal with his wife, who's also an actress. And um, uh, and, and he, he, he's an interesting actor in one way that um, one of the things that you do when you're in the process of, of casting movies is you audition actors. And oftentimes, depending on how you do that, some people do it just by having conversations with that person um, that they're meeting and other people ask them to sort of perform for them to read something from the scenes. And Val was really not good at reading. And so he, he on, on auditions, Val sometimes would undermine his very, you know, getting the job. But Val was a great actor because he was totally present. Um, and inventive. Um, um, and, and so uh, I remember having this conversation about him because I never, I never had him come to audition because I'd seen what he'd done in John's movie. So therefore there was no question of how we, how we could do it. And I remember he had this phrase when he would get, get, uh, he'd get uh, sort of irritated. And he said, I'm going to eat your liver. <laughs> <laughs> and I put that line in, uh, in Heroes, that first uh, feature that I did. Oh yeah, when he got mad, he really, he was just kind of, Amusing, but scary. And I, even though his date with uh, Jenna Rollins, and I think it was a Minion Moskowitz. Yeah. Or no, no, he was also in Faces, right? Um, he was in Faces. That was his. That was his sort of really breakthrough role. The John John's second movie uh, with his wife Jenna Rollins, and he's sort of the the the, the date guy. I can't remember. And then he has the, as you said, in Minion Moskowitz. He also has the, or a fabulous scene in Minion Moskowitz. But he there's a. The strength, and also, I think you're right. There was um, he, he he could uh, exude a kind of danger, um, and that was a, a, a powerful capacity. So he could play in quotes a darker character and do it really well, but also do it from a depth of of, of connection. And that's probably what was also brilliant about Val because. Um, you know, sometimes when an actor is playing a certain kind of negative role, they go to the cliche of that role and do it very well. But you don't feel there's a human being behind that. You, you know, it's just the evil character and you know, caricature. And Val was deeper than that. So even if he was playing somebody dark, like in those two roles we just mentioned in Cassavetes movies, you also kind of, wow, who is this guy and why is he the way he is? Mm -hmm. That was a gift. He was he was an exceptional actor. And I can think of two of your films. It both they were small parts, but uh, you know, in the Chosen and in uh, uh, the Conspiracy, very dialed down, very human performances. Uh, you know, one is the is the head of the the yeshiva announcing that uh, that uh, David Goldberg had been killed during uh, and that's and, foul. Yeah, that's Val, that's Val Avery. Yeah, and I didn't notice that. Also, I noticed while watching the credits yesterday of The Chosen, 
that Mel Howard worked with you. And I thought that he was great in, uh, in um, that movie with uh, the Lower East Side. Yeah, yeah. I know what you I know what you're you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mel's Hester Street. Yeah, Hester Street. Mel is quite well. Yeah, he's wonderful in Hester Street. Yeah, Mel was um, um, assigned to be the production manager on, on The Chosen, and we became really, really good friends all the rest of his life. Uh, in fact, there was an interesting moment when um, um, Michelle LeBron uh, was his wife, and and Mel um, Mel got a bar mitzvah very, very late in life. I think he was in his fifties or something. And um, Mel then got uh, liver disease and had to have a liver transplant, and it didn't didn't take. Um, but as they were going through that process, I said to both of them, to Michelle and to Mel, you should make a film about this. And what they did is they um, they actually sorry I just they um, they made this a, a movie um, essentially about his dying um, and um, it, it became a quite a quite a, a powerful piece that played lots and lots of film festivals um, and I remember because Mel and Michelle are both filmmakers that looking at their own lives and investigating something that was a crisis in their lives and and then using film as a way to express themselves as some people as writers would might use writing to do it uh, and they did a, a quite an quite an amazing job yeah. i mean even other people in the credits i noticed uh, henry bronstein who went on to work on the sopranos as yep. a director barbara defina I, I i rarely watch credits but i did yesterday and i was i was thinking and then pulling out the computer, the one great thing about Google is you've got this fingertip information. Yeah. But um, I, the last question I want to ask, you know, and, and, and you know, we could talk again at another point. But um, when, when you made films like Heroes or The Chosen or Conspiracy or or uh, any of the other films, did you feel that at the time when you were slated for production in pre-production that you were at a place that you were always going to be able to handle things. Did you, in, and in retrospect, when you look back at uh, The Chosen, which I think is such a beautiful piece of art, and I would imagine uh, you were so meticulous in, in, in storyboarding and getting the, the look and everything kosher. Uh, did, you, did you feel, or do you feel in retrospect, like I was in the right place intellectually, artistically, to make the films at that time. And thank God it was in 1981 and not 1975 or 74. That's a fascinating question. And, and, and I think the answer simply is, yes, I was in the right place at the right time and in the right space inside me to be able to deal with and make some of the better movies that I've made. I think there's no question about it. Um, you know, there's this phrase, and I, I repeat this, so I'll repeat it again here. There's this phrase in uh, Yiddish called beshert, um, and it's usually used in terms of she or he's my beshert. Um, sure. And the idea of, of, of fate's not quite the right word, but the kind of the arrangement of events, people, and timing such that something happens and something clicks. And so you, you know, something that was that was beshert. Um, and in many ways, uh, as I step back, the experience of making the chosen, the experience of making Catherine, the movie I was mentioning with Sissy Spacek, like the experience of making the journey of Natty Gann, the, certainly the experience of making Conspiracy, maybe even the experience of making Shot um, most recently. Um, this is beshert. There has been an arrangement in a way where what talent I do have and what energy I do have and what awareness I do have has been sometimes pushed in ways that have allowed me to then contribute in making these films. Um, and oftentimes um, they're not something I necessarily initiated but there's something that came into my consciousness and then I you know, pursued. Um, Roswell is a, a terrific example of this, which is also one of my good movies. This was made for Showtime. Um, and 
uh, Kyle McLaughlin plays uh, one of the leads, as does uh, um, uh, Marty Sheen, who's been in a number of my movies besides my directing in West Wing. And um, he's in Conspiracy. Um, and uh, <laughs> But the way that came is, uh, I, I, you know, one of my colleagues at the American Film Institute, when I first went there, I came when it opened, in it's very, very first class with people like Caleb Deschanel and Terry Malick and David Lynch, it was a very small group of people, um, and um, uh, Paul Schrader, and we were all together, and um, this particular uh, individual, uh, Paul Davids, um, he and his kids had had an experience where they'd seen a UFO. Now, I didn't even know what UFO stood for, and I happened to be going to the birthday party of the guy who was the creative uh, advisor uh, of, the, of the of the AFI at the time, Frank Danielle, and I saw Paul, I hadn't seen him in a long time, we started to talk, and he then told me this story. And I suddenly learned what UFO stood for and the Roswell story, which is an amazing story, and it happened to be because of HBO. Um, I was uh, with the head of HBO and uh, I told him that story and he said, let's go make it. Wow. Now, inevitably, it was too controversial for them. Um, so show, and I really mean that because they wanted to say every fact had to be, you know, everything in the movie had to be. Arthur Coppett, who just recently died, wrote the wow. screenplay, the wonderful playwright. And um, everything we had had to be accurate in terms of what actually happened. Now, I did a Rashomon story because that's what I wanted, because some people said, yes, it was a real contact from uh, outer space of a vehicle. Other people said it was no, nothing but a weather balloon. And other people said not only it was a vehicle, but there were actually beings that were on the vehicle. And other people said not only were there beings, but some of them survived. So these are all versions. And so I, in the Rashomon way, would tell all these different versions, but they, they wanted to have the factual, at least two, two people who would attest to any of the versions. <laughs> Inevitably, you know, they hired a, a, a journalist from the, the Time magazine to wrote a 250 page document of interviews with everybody to sort of like give HBO the confidence that, yes, there are two people who said they were live people, they saw them. Um, <laughs> live. It's so hard to get my head wrapped around it. I love stories like that, but they never come, you know, I think the, the comedian Bill Hicks once said, you know, why is it that these UFOs always go to very rural parts of this country? Yeah, sure. And he described them as like, it's like an intergalactic Jode family riding around. Right, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, it's interesting though, of course, that when you actually deal with the, the very first, even the word UFOs, and where Roswell happened, which is supposedly the first major potential contact that sure. we know about. Um, that was no, you know, yes, it, it was in the middle of the high desert, but what was around was the one air base that had all of our B-29s loaded up with atom bombs. That was where it was in Roswell. So what you're dealing with is the potential of, we know you guys have something that can destroy your planet. Right. Uh, we may want to contact each other. But one of the major things also, by the way, in, in, in fact, Marty Sheen has this moment in that movie, because you mentioned and I know maybe we've talked a long time, so we certainly can stop, but um, is the issue of what is in fact truth. Now, most of the way we look at truth is, is it, can we touch it, literally? And that's one of the reasons why this kind of experience has a, a certain distance from truth because we can't quite touch each other. Um, and as I said, we. But can't. it's fulfilling to me and Bashir because I've always wanted to talk to you. I'm delighted and yeah. I'm enjoying being able to share. And let's get, you know, we, I'll, 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 I'll where, talk where, to you whenever. <laughs> where I was going to go with this is there's yeah. another level of existence. Um, and that level of existence has much more to do with, if we put, give it a name, a metaphysical level of existence. Um, a level of existence that doesn't necessarily define itself by our five senses. And sometimes we experience things like coincidences. Bashir, I'm using that. Well, if I hadn't met this guy at that party, I wasn't going to go to that party, but I did. But I got out of it. then all of this happened. Why did it all happen? I didn't arrange it. 
Uh, I yeah, you, I took yeah. advantage of it. When the right. door opens, you step into it, or you can step into it. But my point is, there's there's another there are other levels of existence. They are, you know, if you take dreams seriously, dream worlds can have their own power and reality. And if you sort of appreciate um, the indigenous teachings uh, and some of the sort of gifts of the plant life that exists around us you're also realizing that there are other ways of perception than the ones that we think are the quote truth. And one of the things that comes out of the sort of alien contact issue is maybe we're not talking necessarily about the physicality of a spaceship or an alien, but on another level of communication, if you will, on alter universes or multi universes that are not just defined by the gravities uh, you know uh, um, that we understand or electromagnetism but there's something else going on you begin to then say oh wait a minute we may very well not be the only quote species of awareness and consciousness that is in this multiverse world and that's something that the movie Roswell puts out at the very end of it, because, you know, the idea of wanting to say, oh, it's got to be, you know, it, it's got to look like and touch like and feel like um, you know, what we know as our physical realities of our five senses may be limiting. I was just listening to I don't know, the, the, the whale songs. There's a, a wonderful series called uh, Secrets of uh, uh, the Whales that uh, that um, Cameron, uh, James Cameron just put out there. Oh, really? National Geographic. It's fabulous. You should show your daughter. It's okay. amazing. The vi I just looked at it this week. The The videos are astounding. The so images of, too. of beluga whales and sperm whales and obviously humpbacks. But the humpback sings. And I knew this from way back in the 60s when there was an album called, you know, Songs of the Humpback Whale, which was an LP. And I remember getting it and going, what? What's fascinating is that I just heard this yesterday, is to listen to the sounds of the humpbacks that are clearly songs, because they, you, you know, write, the, the, the sheet music write, wrote, writes down the notes and played as a song. And what they did, which was just fabulous, is they had an instrument they used it's one of the instruments i happen to play so i know it they used a bass clarinet and they used the real whale sounds and they put the two together so that the bass clarinet line sounds more like a music that we understand so mm -hmm. you can follow it but right behind it and next to it is the whale sound and yes clearly the centralized sound of the whale sound is that note that the bass clarinet's playing but you can also see that above and below that to our hearing and then beyond our capacity of hearing because the machines can record it the whale is also making other sound at the same time it's making this sound now what i'm saying is this and then what we don't see in here exists oh that's magnificent that's beautiful I think that you're, you you might be the head of a, a neo Hasidic movement. You don't even know about it, incorporating <laughs> all, <laughs> incorporating wildlife as well. No, it's 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 fantastic. And uh, listen, this was far greater than I expected, though I knew it would be great. And I'm so delighted to talk to you. And uh, next time we talk, you'll have to tell me a, a Rod Steiger story or two. But this is. I think this uh, people will really enjoy this, and and well, I'm glad it's it's a it's a it is a privilege, honestly, yeah. to be able to spend time. And thank you for your conversation. I'm and enjoying. I'll, this. I'll I'll, I'll say a and I'll do it again. <laughs> I'll, good. I'll say a bracha for you tonight uh, as we greet the uh, the Shabbos Queen. But uh, maybe maybe I'll be part of the Zoom Havdalah. Fair enough. I love it. All right. All right. Take care well. of yourself. Thank, thank you. you too. Bye Enjoy bye. Enjoy your daughter. Bye bye. You too. Thank <laughs> you.